And, um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the Stanford Algebraic Geometry Seminar. Uh, a few uh, announcements before we start. Please mute yourself unless you have something you wish to say. Uh, but if you're willing, please leave your video on. Uh, and for those interested, there is a parallel chat in Discord. But you should use this only if you feel like it, because some people find it distracting and others find it helps them concentrate. Uh, the speaker will not be watching the chat or the Zoom chat. Uh, the style of the seminar has traditionally been that people ask the speaker a lot of questions and interrupt him or her, including quite elementary ones. So please do so. So uh, the seminar is small enough that if you uh, that if you have a question, just unmute yourself and ask it out loud. Don't raise your hand. Don't press any buttons. Um, and uh, or if you see a question in the discussion that you think should be asked, just unmute yourself and ask it out loud. Uh, so it's a so it's a pleasure to. Uh, actually, it's always a particular pleasure to have my good friend Brendan Hassett here. Uh, I guess the story, one thing which is true, one thing which I think many people know is that much of the way which I think what algebraic geometry was learned from him, not in a classroom, but on a subway between Harvard and MIT as we were going to Dan and Brownovich's uh, class. Uh, so, uh, so it's always great to hear him speak. Uh, and so he'll tell us about symbols by rational geometry and computations. Thanks, Ravi. Um, for those of you that are still students, I'll just emphasize that most of what I learned in graduate school, um, I learned from Ravi and, and my other fellow students, with all due respect to my advisor, but you know, those conversations were a, a big part of my education too. So um, yeah, it's, it's great to be able to speak here. I want to talk a little bit about my goals and what I'm doing here. Um, I've been using the time at home to, uh, to try to learn something new and learn some new formalism as and how to think about birational geometry. And so this is sort of like my book report. Uh, I've been trying to learn these things. And so maybe I can share with you some of the things that I've learned um, with, the, with the hope that it'll be interesting and useful to you in your own work. So let me get started. Uh, so let me um, give some of the basic background questions. All right, so um, throughout, we're going to be working over the complex numbers. And suppose that we have a finite group. And um, I want this group to act birationally, faithfully on a complex variety. And there's not much harm in assuming that the, uh, the complex variety is projective and that G actually acts regularly on that projective variety. Basic idea is um, if you look at the birational action, and you kind of close up the graph appropriately. Um, on the closed graph, there'll actually be a regular action. And the closed graph might be singular, but you can blow up equivariantly so as to, uh, to get a, a reasonable model. And, um, and so then you have a smooth projective variety on which G acts. And again, I'm always going to be working over the complex numbers, nothing in characteristic P here. And so one of the things that uh, has been a long question of interest is to classify such finite group actions uh, up to conjugation in the uh, birational automorphism group. Um, and so this is basically um, classifying varieties of the group action that happen to be birational to projective space. Um, and uh, the Cremona group is a group of birational automorphisms of projective space. And so this basically boils down to understanding conjugacy classes of finite subgroups of the Cremona group. So this is impossible to, um, to summarize. I'm going to give many examples, but I want to say just a little bit about what has been done. Uh, I will exclude all the work in the 19th century, which is extensive. There is a huge literature on this in the 19th century um, that I will not try to summarize. Um, but there's work of a lot of the big names in, um, in classical algebraic geometry. Uh, uh, like Bertini, uh, so you know he, he contributed a lot. I'm going to talk about things that have happened since I was born, which is still a long time, but is a, bounds the literature a bit. And so basically, in modern times, this problem has been approached from the standpoint of the minimal models and by rational geometry as developed um, by the Mori school. And the basic groundwork for all this was laid by Iskopsky and, and Manin. 
And he basically described the minimal models of surfaces, even surfaces over non-closed fields or with G actions and how they are linked together. What are the basic um, steps between uh, different birational models? So he both classified the objects and classified the links between them. Um, and so this was done quite some time ago and um, about maybe 20 years ago, people started to systematically apply this uh, machinery uh, to classify actions in various situations on surfaces. Um, so the Beauville, Bay, Defernac, Blanc, they looked at finite abelian groups and then Dolgachov and Niskovsky largely completed the, the analysis for surfaces. Um, there are some Galois cohomological approaches that have been developed by uh, Bogomolov and Prokhorov uh, using uh, the, looking at the action of the group on the on the middle cohomology and getting invariance along those lines. Um, and there's been a ton of work for threefolds uh, for many specific groups. Uh, so there's a lot of analysis of classifying, if you have a, a large and fairly complicated simple group, classifying how it can be uh, embedded as, as birational automorphisms of, uh, of the protective space. So, so this is sort of the mainstream of this. And I want to work perpendicular to this, but I feel some responsibility to at least inform you about the mainstream of, of how this subject has developed. Um, and so let me say a little bit more about the philosophy. So, so basically, the thinking here is um, coming from the minimal model program. And I'm not going to tell you about log terminal or canonical singularities. I'm not going to go into the, to the, into the, into the weeds. But basically, the minimal model program is, is about trying to find a distinguished model for a, a given variety, and also a distinguished model for a variety when it comes equipped with automorphisms or additional structure. Um, and so here we're looking at um, varieties that are geometric, that are rational and admit actions of finite groups. And so then you can, you can, you can look at minimal cases, uh, sort of cases that are blown down as much as possible, like P2 and P1 cross P1, cubic surfaces, et cetera, and then analyze the finite group actions on those specific examples. Um, and then there's general theory that says that if you do enough of these sort of um, distinguished special examples, then you have a complete classification. So the, essentially, the minimal model program says, here are all the things that you could possibly look at. And if you see it in this list, then you've, it, it, if, you, if you're going to see it, you'll see it on this list of examples. And then you go through and you write down equations from those examples, you just turn the crank. And you, know, you classify, for instance, um, for cubic surfaces, you write down all the subgroups of the, of the automorphisms of P3, of PGL4, that preserve a cubic surface. You just do it by brute force, basically, and you get a classification. Um, and so this is the dominant stream in this, and it's worked very successfully since the 19th century. Um, but it doesn't really rely on machinery or invariance to distinguish things. Um, so there's not like sort of a, a magic wand that will tell you that two things are similar or distinct. You have to just go through and put them into the classification. The classification gives you a distinguished model. And then you say, are the distinguished models linked to each other? Um, so you have to do quite a lot of work to actually decide whether uh, two things are equivalent as uh, varieties with, with group action. Um, and so it'd be nice if there was a more sort of an invariant theoretical approach, um, something that would allow you to distinguish without going so deeply into the geometry. Um, and so there are a few examples of invariants that come from cohomology, like the bogomola prokhorov invariant, where you look at the Galois cohomology of the group on, uh, on the middle cohomology of the surface. Um, and so I'll talk a bit more about these as I get into it, but this is not the mainstream of investigation. So, um, so I, I'd like to, again, go orthogonal to this. So let me pause. So, so Brendan, there's a quick question about where yeah. you, does, whether the, where the surface case is written down. So the, the surface case, um, there is a comprehensive, hold on. 
There's a comprehensive survey by Dolgachov and Iskowski that presents most of the surface case. Um, it's a very long paper. It's on the archive. I think that for people that want um, a uh, sort of orientation of what the theory looks like, Locke's thesis. So I think he did his doctorate in Geneva. It gives a very uh, systematic analysis of um, the actions of cyclic groups and some other abelian groups. And so that's a good place to look for a background. But um, yeah, I think those are the, the, the two papers that give a, a broad overview of this theory. Are there any other questions? Okay. So now let me show you what the invariants will be. And so these invariants have been developed by uh, Konsevich, Pestun, and Schinkel. And so let me tell you a little bit about them. So again, we're always going to have a smooth projective variety. And for, this, for the moment, let me assume that we have a cyclic group of prime order acting just to um, reduce some of the complexity. Uh, and then I, I look at this smooth projective variety and I identify the points that are fixed under this cyclic group action. The low side that are fixed, uh, you can describe them pretty explicitly. Um, I mean, in some sense, locally, they're conjugate to um, subspaces. Uh, if you have a fixed point, you kind of look at the action of the cyclic group on the tangent space, you diagonalize it, you identify the invariant subspaces, and that locally gives you the equations for the fixed loci. So in particular, these fixed loci are <coughs> smooth and closed subvarieties. Um, and so this is the best possible situation you can be in. Excuse me. So you have these fixed points. What I'd like to do is I'd like to look at the action of the cyclic group on the tangent space at the fixed points. And so again, we're working over the complex numbers and we have a cyclic group act, acting, so we can diagonalize. And um, the action is completely determined by the weights. Was it one of these doors or something? No, it was outside. Okay, just outside, thanks. Yeah. I don't think that was a question. Okay. So, um, and so you have these weights, and then what we'll do is we simply keep track of all the weights um, at each fixed point locus. That is, we, we index all of the connected components of the fixed point locus by uh, index alpha. And for each alpha, we pick some representative, um, and we look at the action of the, tan of the cyclic group on the tangent space, and we just record those. As a as a symbol, um, Brendan. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, Jordan. Hey, are we the zero ones too? They're also on the list. Like, is little n the dimension of x or the co-dimension of the fixed locus? Uh, little little n is a dimension of x. So I am keeping track. So some of the a a's can be zero. Okay. Cool. Um, yes. Any other questions? Okay. So I keep track of all of them. And so for instance, like if we have an involution on a surface that uh, fixes, fixes um, a divisor, uh, I'll have a, a zero because the divisor is, is fixed on the surface. And then I'll keep track of the action in the normal direction. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to take this and to, to, to use it to get a well-defined birational invariant. So, before I do that, let me show a couple of examples. So just to, for you to see how this works, the, um, obviously the most central examples are linear actions on P2, and so we're just sort of keeping track of the weights on the tangent spaces. Um, and so this is probably the easiest, easiest case to think about. Um, another example is a, you could look at a double cover of the plane P2 branching along a, a quartic curve. Uh, and then you have the covering involution. Um, so this is the surface X. It's, and so the covering, covering involution, as I mentioned before, it fixes the plane curve and acts by multiplication by minus one in the normal directions to that plane curve. And so we get a single symbol with a zero here. So the zeros do show up. 
Okay, sorry for this slide, but I really wanted to get everything in one place. Uh, maybe this is a bad, bad judgment, but all right. So I'm going to let G be now in a general abelian group and let A be the character, so the one dimensional representations of G. And so I'm going to look at symbols um, whose entries consist of N elements taken from, from this character group. And I want to assume that the symbols generate the uh, group. And so this is a very reasonable assumption because um, if you have a faithful action, you'll be able to sort of see that faithful action on the tangent spaces at the fixed points. So again, I'm, I, I'm working on an n-dimensional co complex protective variety. And so then I take the free abelian group on all those symbols. Um, so it's finally generated, but it, it's pretty big. And then I impose the natural relations from the perspective of the geometry. So first of all, I, ins I don't care how I order the, uh, the eigenvectors of the tangent space. And so I freely permute the, the <coughs> permute the different directions that doesn't change the symbol. And then I have this other relation, which is kind of complicated. Um, and so it basically involves partitioning the symbols into parts and then subtracting sequentially all the distinct entries that appear from the relevant part of the symbol. And so I, I don't think I want to say a lot about the algebra except to tell you what we're doing here. So imagine that if I have a fixed point um, uh, under the action and I blow that fixed point up. And so when I blow that fixed point up, I get a projective space. And, and the projective space is just a projectivization of the representation of our, our group on the tangent space. And so in that projective space, I have a whole bunch of distinguished linear subspaces that are fixed. Um, you know, I've diagonalized the action near the fixed point. That gives me some distinguished subspaces in, uh, in that projective space. And those distinguished subspaces, some of them are fixed under the group action. And so in that blow up, I have to keep track of all the fixed points that come from the exceptional divisor. And so there's some bookkeeping that you have to do in order to, to keep track of that. Um, you have to keep in mind that if you have um, a given weight that appears multiple times, the fixed point locus would have positive dimension in the exceptional, in the exceptional divisor. And so this relation is basically designed to, to encode that, that we can just read off when I blow up a fixed point, what all what are all the relevant invariant, uh, excuse me, fixed loci in the blow up. And so if our goal is to have a birational invariant, we, we, we need to impose conditions like this. Okay, so I tried to explain a little bit here, but the, the algebra from a simple perspective is pretty straightforward. I mean, this is not so, you get, if you think a bit about this as giving a matrix of relations, you get a nice fairly sparse matrix of relations by, by imposing these conditions. Are there any questions? Uh, Brendan, how do we know which of the, uh, you know, fixed points, low side and the exceptional divisor lie in the same irreducible component and, and which don't? Um, when I look at the exceptional divisor, let's just take it in the case where I have a fixed point. Um, so, if I've diagonalized the tangent space to the um, fixed point, um, I keep track of those, those eigenvectors and I use those as a coordinate system. And so all of the um, fixed point loci will be linear subspaces that are expressible naturally in that coordinate system. And so, I mean, you're just saying, all right, which subsets are relevant. And so the relevant subsets is you just keep track of all of the uh, vectors that have a, a common eigen, eigenvalue. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it's really just linear subspaces. Uh, 
Um, so what I'm thinking is that you have one term for each irreducible component of the fixed point locus. Is that right? Uh, in the, yes, in this case, you have one term for each irreducible component. Is it possible that some of them may not be in, this, in different irreducible components, that some may be in the same irreducible component? Um, the, so there's this wonky aspect of the indexing here, where I insist that the AI is not equal to AI prime for any I prime less than I. That indexing is what allows one to keep track of the components. Okay, thanks. I, I think I get it. Okay. So, um, so then in order to get the invariant, well, what we do is we look at, um, we, uh, look at this, again, the partition of the fixed point loci into connected components. And for each of them, we take this summation of the invariants, but now interpreted in, um, in this group. And so, and so the theorem that I should have explained here, um, should have stated here more explicitly, is that this actually does give you uh, a birational invariant in a category of G actions on smooth projective varieties. Uh, and so this is an application of, uh, of weak factorization. Um, so you just take any birational map between two pairs and you factor it as a sequence of blow ups and blow downs along smooth centers and then inductively show that this relation is preserved. Um, there is a precursor invariant to this um, that has a pretty similar spirit, which is, goes back to Reichstein and Usen. So they, they develop a, 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 something that is quite, quite analogous by looking at sort of the determinantal character on the tangent bundle. And so this gives information about um, some finite groups, and they also extract information about algebraic groups. Um, it's not a great invariant for cyclic groups, um, because I think it, you know, for cyclic groups, it really is most useful in dimension one, but there's some, there's a, a certain amount of commonality. Uh, so the, this is a, a important precursor to this invariant. So now let me present some examples. So let me start with curves. Um, and so for curves, for the students, um, this, if you know the Riemann existence theorem, that is, if you have, um, if you have a hygienist curve, you puncture it at a bunch of points, then you can produce coverings that have prescribed ramification um, at those points. Um, and so the key thing is that at each point, you keep track of sort of how the generating element of the Galois group, what, what primitive root of unity acts on the tangent space. And so for this reason, when you're looking at curves, the space of invariance for a cyclic group is, um, is given by the, the, the Euler function, so the Euler totient function. Uh, it's indexed by the number of uh, congruence classes mod n that are relatively prime. Um, and so, yeah, so, so the group is pretty simple. Um, on P1, of course, there's a, a real restriction. Uh, if you have a cyclic group acting on P1, well, this is, I guess, uh, maybe what I said here is not quite correct, but this is the simplest uh, example. Um, so then uh, you get this, this cyclic group actions. And so here you get the symbol, you have um, plus, plus one and minus one eigenvalues um, at zero and infinity. Um, for some purposes, you might want to remove that relation and, and that basically corresponds to uh, collapsing these P1s with cyclic group actions. Um, and so, I may not be able to talk much about that, but that's a pretty natural algebraic operation that gives you a coarser invariant than what we discussed. Actually, could you say uh, that again? Why would you want to? Why would you want to do that? 
So if you're interested in um, if you're interested in classifying um, classifying non-trivial group actions in the sense that they're not equivalent to linear actions on projective space, then it makes sense to, 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 to take actions that sort of collapse all of the invariants that come from actions on projective space. Great, thanks. Um, so, I mean, in some sense, it's sort of like a, I mean, I think that this would probably be a pretty useful tool in analyzing sort of stable birational equivalence classes as well, um, where you just take products with uh, linear representations on projective space. So, yeah, so one of our motivations is to sort of understand things uh, and how, which, which birational actions do not admit representations as linear actions on projective space. And so then coming back to this, for higher genus curves, you can basically produce whatever symbols you want just by using the Riemann existence theorem. Um, so as a general rule, the, um, the, if you don't restrict yourselves to, um, to rational varieties, you can get whatever symbols you want. And so this is sort of a, a, a sample theorem in that direction that um, if you allow yourself to consider um, varieties of general type, you can essentially get whatever symbols you want, at least working for a cyclic group of order P. Uh, you can construct um, examples of varieties, uh, albeit a very large degree and with very complicated invariants that have whatever actions that you want. Um, and so essentially the idea is that you construct a representation that has um, the, the symbols that you want as summons in the representation. And then you take some complete intersection that kind of tracks uh, the action to that representation uh, to sufficiently high order so that the corresponding complete intersection inherits the same kind of, same kind of group actions. Um, and so you get a huge degree complete intersection, but you can produce smooth examples um, that have these prescribed invariants. And so you really, prop in order for these invariants to be kind of prescriptive, I mean, you probably want to look at, ex you don't want to look at all varieties at once necessarily. Of course, a birational classification of um, varieties of general type is not so interesting because um, in, you, have, you obviously will get a, a, an action of your finite group on a canonical model. Uh, so the natural area where things are hard and interesting is when you have varieties that are either rational or close to being rational, like rationally connected. Okay. So and I just wanted to give a few more ex examples of linear actions. So based on the machinery, the, the linear actions, they are not a priori trivial. I mean, the, you, you actually have non-equivalent linear actions up to birational equivalence. Um, and so, so you can take sort of refinements of, or, or coarsenings of the invariants, impose more relations uh, to, to make these linear actions trivial. And in some cases, that's pretty useful uh, when you want to distinguish um, a, uh, a given action from a linear action, if you know that the that these linear actions are trivial, or they become trivial after imposing some straightforward relations. That's that's helpful. And so, I'm also doing this to, just to give you an example of how the, you know, this is sort of like the fixed point example I talked about uh, previously. I probably put a, should have put the slide three or four slides earlier. So this just shows how if you have um, if you have CN acting on projective space with distinct characters, you can really see how keeping track of the, the data on the, of how it acts on the tangent spaces of the coordinate axes, how you get things that are closely related to, but not quite equivalent to these, uh, these, these relations. Sorry, Brendan, why do you need the AI to be distinct for this? Since I'm allowed to have zero in these symbols, why is that necessary? Um, it's necessary because I want to make a correct statement about what the fixed point loci 
are. Huh. And so if, the, if I were to allow the, uh, the weights to be equal, then I would get sort of a partition of, of n, and then I would have to sort of write down symbols that reflect the structure of that partition. So it's, huh. it's, it's basically so I can write something intelligible on the slide. Or, or I can suppress the indexing notation that caused some consternation five minutes ago. <laughs> okay, so it's not like you wouldn't know the symbol in that case. It's just a matter of to write down the symbol. No, know. it's just, yeah, right. so I can write down an explicit example. Got it. Okay. All right, so what I like to spend a fair amount of the presentation about is to talk about surfaces and let me reiterate the surface classification is is known and I think has been in some sense known for a very long time, but most of the the final refinements have been complete for the last decade. But I, I just want to show you how this is a useful way of organizing information about surfaces. And it, it gives you a, a different perspective on the on the classification results that we have. So the first thing I want to point out is um, we have a lot of invariants. So the invariants grow pretty quickly. Now, most of these invariants are not realized by, um, by actions of our cyclic group on a rational variety. For most cases, if you want to actually see this, these invariants, you're going to have to have some horrible surface of general type. Um, but there's a really nice structure in these invariants that, um, that is still being revealed. So if you look at the invariance over Q, so there's torsion that I'm going to ignore here. The dimension uh, for a cyclic group of prime order is um, P squared plus 23 divided by 24. If I, I, I hope I said P greater than three, but if not, I apologize. And that's more or less the genus of the modular curve. There's a little bit of a fudge factor here that involves uh, the, the Euler phi function divided by two. Um, but it's, it's interesting that these genera, um, that they're for the modular curves, that they are, they are related to the number of invariants. And so the symbol formalism that, um, that I presented before is closely related to, but not quite equivalent to the formula of modular symbols, Manin's mon modular symbols formalism. Um, and so using that identification, you can prove the uh, relationship between the genera of the modular curves and the spaces of invariance. Um, these, um, these invariants exist in higher dimensions too. And so the interpretation of the higher dimensional invariants through, um, through automorphic forms is still a little bit mysterious, uh, but we have a pretty good handle on things for, um, for surface invariance. And so just um, so, so, I, so I get, actually a question, Brendan, is it is this a is this a coincidence or is this like what you're you seem to be suggesting? I mean, if there are no coincidences in mathematics, there's there. Yeah, why? What's the what should we see from this? This is very suggestive. But I don't know what it's what what I should what I should guess. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence. And I, I don't, th and I don't think I understand it properly. Um, there's a proof that says m modular symbols compute um, the topology of modular curves. Very similar symbols compute the, um, you know, these, these invariants. And but, well, the, you have the same computation, so it gives you the same result. But there pr should probably be some kind of I don't know, cohomology theory associated with mo modular curves with level structure that explains this. You know, something a bit more scientific um, that, but I don't understand it. And so this is really suggestive, but I mean, this is proven, but it's proven by showing that both sides are computed by the same gadget. Um, and so one of the interesting things is that the, um, the symbols come with, with a torsion data. Um, and so I'm not sure that there is a ready interpretation of the torsion in terms of modular curves. 
and probably can be interpreted in terms of some kind of um, uh, orbifold cohomology where you give some non-trivial orbifold structure at the cusps, but I haven't seen it done in this case yet. Um, so anyway, there's some nice structure here. Are there any other questions? Is there a way to produce the uh, holomorphic form from a symbol and check that they satisfy the same relations? Or? So I, there are probably people in the seminar that know this much better than I do. But my understanding is that you um, you use the symbols to, uh, to write down geodesics in the upper half plane. Um, and then you use those geodesics to get a, a basis of homology for the modular curve. Um, and the, there's enough geodesics in the upper half plane to allow you to really understand all of the interesting dynamics, the fixed point properties for the action of the upper half plane of, of the SL2Z on the upper half plane or the congruent subgroups. And so it's a rich enough set, of, you have enough curves to really see the whole homology. Um, but I don't think that there's a direct, I don't know a direct connection with the holomorphic forms. Thank you. Okay, so let me point out that um, B2 of the cyclic group of order two is zero. And that should be a little bit offensive to people who are aficionados of the birational geometry of uh, rational surfaces, because if you know that theory, most of the, most, the, most of the intricate things that happen are for involutions. Involutions are the, by far the most um, delicate um, by rational automorphisms of, of, of rational varieties. You have Bertini involutions, Geischer, inv I could give a whole lecture on these things. Um, so like one of these involutions is the covering involution of uh, degree two del Pezzo surface. And there are a lot of them out there. It, and it depends on the, uh, the modulus of the, of the, of the, 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 um, the fixed point locus, uh, the branch locus. And so, the fact that this invariant is zero, it might cause you to, to throw out the whole theory, but you probably should be patient because you can refine things. And so by introducing symbols, the symbols that Jordan pointed out, the A0 symbols, you can also keep track of the, um, the isomorphism class of the corresponding fixed point curves. Um, and so the general machinery is that you'd want to keep track of sort of a stable birational class of these curves. Um, so in surfaces, you can't really blow up these curves at all, but in higher dimensions, uh, if you're going to encode the, the class of the fixed point locus, the, if you blow it up, you replace the fixed point locus by something times um, uh, a linear subspace. And so you need to keep track of that. And so then you can get a, a sort of refinement of these groups where when you encode the fixed points, you also encode the stable birational class. Um, and so in general, when you do this for higher dimensions, um, you get contributions from all the lower dimensional um, pieces. And so the way to think about this is that if I want to understand say cyclic group actions of prime order on a, a n-dimensional variety, the answer should be, should involve keeping track of all of the, um, all of the data associated with the, the fixed point strata and their class in the Grotnik ring and the corresponding normal bundles in all the lower dimensions. And so that sounds a little daunting, but you should see it as progress that I've taken something in dimension n and reduce it to an analysis of sort of stable birational, equivariant birational geometry in smaller dimensions. And so, so this is, um, so the involutions on surface, they sort of point to, uh, to a generalization where you actually keep track of this additional data. So let me see if I have a, do I have an example? I'll have another example later on. So just bear with me. Actually, there is an example right here on this slide. 
So I gave some, um, some analysis of uh, order three actions on surfaces. And though the one thing I want to point out is the action on, uh, on cubic surfaces of the form W cubed equals a uh, plane cubic. And so those have a, an action of a cyclic group of order three. They have, again, one of these invariants, one comma zero. Um, and if you keep track of the, um, the birational or the isomorphism type of the fixed point locus, you get a complete classification of these cubic surfaces. All right, just for fun, I took the largest order automorphisms that I could find. And so, so here's an example of a automorphism of order 30. And I computed the weights and the invariant. Um, so this computation is in a 55 dimensional space, which is kind of irritating because um, there's not that many, I mean, this is sort of a very special distinguished example. Um, and so it's a little strange to look in a 55 dimensional space to distinguish this from a standard linear action. Well, but that's what the machinery does. Um, you can compute it and you get that something is, it's actually non-zero. And I did the next largest action just for fun. Uh, and so this gives you uh, a, a tool for distinguishing um, these fairly high complexity actions of cyclic groups. Um, you have to do a lot of linear algebra to get the answers, but you don't have to do any birational geometry per se. Um, you don't have to sort of compute minimal models and analyze the links. You just, you know, you run the machine to get an answer. All right. Um, so let me uh, point out some generalizations. And so there is a, a generalization that has been worked out by Andrew Kresh and Schinkel. Um, and so here's the, the, the setup. So basically, this is intended to um, this is intended to allow you to analyze actions of not necessarily abelian groups. Um, but yeah. uh, uh -oh. Web, web okay. I'm sorry. If that was a question, could you repeat it? Okay. So, so the setup is you have a finite, but not necessarily abelian group, and you want to choose a model of it so that all of the, the stabilizers are abelian. In fact, you really want the stabilizer locus to, um, to be a normal crossings divisor in, in a strict sense so that um, if you have two components of the divisor, uh, meeting, then they can't be conjugate to each other in the group. Um, and so, so there is a resolution scheme of Reichstein and Eusen that does this. Um, I, I think you can also, well, the, 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 the paper on this uses the divisorification algorithm of Berg and Reed uh, applied to the quotient stack. Um, but there is a standard way of taking uh, an action of a group on X and putting it in the standard form so that locally the non-trivial stabilizer locus is normal crossings. And so if you look at some point, you, you, locally in the atal topology, you only have coordinate axes and you, 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 know, you have a finite fundamental group, uh, abelian fundamental group. And so you, you don't really have to worry about the non-abelian structure when you look locally. Of course, the non-abelian aspects are encoded in how the various components of the strata are mapped to each other under the group. Okay, and so now in defining the invariant, what they do is that they don't just look at the fixed point strata, they look at all the strata that have non-trivial stabilizer. And then, so this non-trivial stabilizer H, which is abelian, and then you look at the normalizer of that abelian group and you keep track of how it acts on the, um, on, on the orbit of those loci with, with, with non-zero stabilizers. Um, and then you keep track of 
two kinds of data. You keep track of the, uh, the action on the normal bundle as before, that's a character data. So that's completely analogous. Um, you keep track of how the normalizer acts in the various components um, that may be conjugated by the group. And finally, you keep track of the birational types of the strata with the induced group actions. And so these strata are lower dimensional. And so that is an improvement. You've gone from an n-dimensional variety to, to varieties of, of n minus one dimensional. Um, and then you, as before, there's a, a, a simple formalism in blow up relations that are pretty complicated to write down. Um, but they're there, you can write them down. I think this, the paper that presents this will be on the archive. If it's not now, it will be on the archive any day now. And so they, you get a similar thing where you're summing over, over a billion subgroups, they have non-trivial stabilizer, you're keeping track of the strata, and there are classes in the Grotnik ring or the birational, stable birational classes. And so now coming back to the uh, cyclic action, cyclic group actions on rational surfaces, the, this machinery recovers an invariant due to a Blanc called the normalized fixed curve uh, invariant. And so basically what that is, is for each element of the cyclic group, you keep track of all the curves uh, that are fixed by that element, the isomorphism classes of those curves and how the elements act on the, um, the normal bundle, and you get an invariant, and that is a complete invariant of cyclic group actions on rational surfaces. And so this, um, this invariant, it encodes all of the, all of the data that's needed to, to classify cyclic group actions on rational surfaces. I am not sure whether, whether it's as successful for, um, for arbitrary groups, um, but it gives you a sort of conceptual scaffold to put the, these existing results of Blanc. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is to give some examples. So probably the most um, notable example of, of this is an example of Skofsky where he shows that there are two non-conjugate copies of S2 cross S3 in the uh, Cremona group for, uh, for P2. And one of them is sort of additive, you know, it's like a, a trace thing. And the other is uh, multiplicative. It's kind of like a norm thing. Um, so you just take the action on these uh, symmetric loci and you by permutation and inverses. And in the first case, you get a model that's a P2. In the second case, you get a model that is a sectic del Pezzo surface. Um, you have to blow up to satisfy the stabilizer conditions. Um, and then you keep track of P1s that are stabilized by um, the distinguished cyclic group of order two with an induced S3 action. And you keep track of those um, and count the number of centers of that type. And one of these has um, has two centers and the other has a single center. And so you can use this to actually distinguish these two examples. Um, and so this is presented by Eskofsky and it requires quite a lot of work fiddling with the models. And so I think that these invariants give you at least another more algebraic perspective on why these are distinct. Um, basically you have these two distinguished um, symbol invariants that correspond to um, P1s with non-trivial stabilizer and induced S3 action. And in some sense, the number of these that you get, you can't really mess with it very much by blowing up along these fixed point strata. And so you can use this to extract an invariant from the symbol group. So here's an example of how this can be used. All right, I'm gonna talk, let's see. I am short on time, so I'm going to say just a little bit about threefolds, and 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 then go to fourfolds. So um, this is a, a tabulation of the Q ranks and the torsion here, and so there's some. Um, the there are some conjectures as to how these grow, but it's 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 not very well understood. There's not really much in the way of theorems. 
uh, but there are a number of contractors in the paper by Kontsevich, Pestrun, and Schinkel um, about what these numbers mean. And uh, there's lots of students who are tabulating these out to uh, much higher values of n than I've done, but I just wanted to give you the overall um, picture. So just as a way of example, we can look at um, complete intersections of two quadrics. Um, and so these complete intersections of two quadrics, associated with them is a hyperelliptic curve of genus two. And the automorphism of the complete intersection of these two quadrics is related to the automorphism group of the hyperelliptic curve. Um, but there's an additional two, um, two elementary part that reflects the fact that I can take the XIs and I can reverse their sign and it doesn't change um, whether it lies on this diagonalized complete intersection. And so, um, and so you can look at these cases and see when these invariants shed light and when they don't shed light. And so, um, so they don't tell the whole story, obviously. Uh, so here's a case where it's um, not a rational, but because the only invariant available is a B2 invariant, it's, um, it's zero. But if you take a slightly larger action of a group of order four, uh, where you have this um, diagonalized involution, but you also allow yourself to exchange the, um, the first two variables, then you do get an, a non-trivial um, invariant. And so, um, so these are useful in, in analyzing these uh, threefolds from a birational perspective, but they're not completely dispositive. So I don't actually know how to use a symbol invariance to give a complete, um, a complete analysis of the rationality of these examples, just using symbol formalism. I'm going to skip this example because I'm running short on time. And so let me talk a little bit about fourfolds. And so really, I just have one, one example, which is one of my favorite examples. So let's look at a cubic fourfold. Um, so cubic fourfolds are smooth uh, cubic hypersurfaces in P5. And uh, Ravi can tell you that I've been obsessing about these for an uh, unreasonably long period of time. Um, so I wrote my thesis about them. And so 25 years later, I haven't really made that much progress in understanding them, but I, I'm not easily deterred. So cubic fourfolds are known to be rational in many situations, but there are no examples known to be irrational. And there's a, a lot of um, heuristics as to how to distinguish the rational from the irrational examples. But since we don't have technology for proving these to be irrational, well, it's, it's, these things tend to be a bit speculative. However, we can, take a slightly different problem. And we can ask, if I have a cubic fourfold with an action of a cyclic group, um, can it be rational in such a way that that cyclic group is ported over to a, to a linear action on projective space? So in other words, we're asking for a, a birational map from X to P4 that respects the action of the cyclic group and takes it to something that's um, automorphism on the projective space. And so there are, in fact, examples, again, of highly symmetrical cubic fourfolds, uh, ones with have um, automorphisms of large order. And so these seem to be the cases where these invariants are most um, effective, at least in an IE form. So I have this example with an automorphism of order 36 um, with uh, the, these weights 0, 4, minus 8, 16, 9, and 18. And if you compute the, uh, the symbol invariant, and this is a very, it's very easy to compute what the symbols are because you're basically just looking at the coordinate axes. 
it's fairly hard to, to show that beta is non-zero because um, right now, if you think about it, you're taking a cyclic group of order 36 and uh, you're taking, I mean, there's just a lot, it's a, it's a very large group. Um, and so I, I think um, to, to, to evaluate this as non-zero, it took most of the computational resources of the Simons Foundation. It's not an easy task, but it is an invariant. Um, and I don't think there's another tool for showing that these cubic fourfolds with the indicated cyclic group actions are not equivalent to, um, to P4. And so there are even examples along the lines where, um, well, there's an even harder example uh, using stabilizers, the things that are fixed by, uh, by this cyclic subgroup of order three. And so here you, um, you have X1 that's fixed by this, and then you're looking at a cubic threefold and analyzing cyclic groups, uh, cyclic group actions on cubic threefolds. And this is an example that, that indicates how you can use this machinery to take a problem on fourfolds of biastral classification and reduce it to a problem on threefolds, um, namely the cubic threefolds uh, with, with actions of these cyclic groups of order three. In some sense, this is similar to what we did before, right? When I showed you the cubic surfaces and I wanted to classify them, in the presence of this, of this action, I said, well, you can reduce it to a elliptic, elliptic curve case. And so here we're doing the kind of same thing, but I'm reducing it to a cubic threefold case. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is that there are examples of cubic fourfolds that are Fafian and are, in fact are known to be rational, uh, but have a cyclic group action with uh, a non-vanishing invariant. So this first example, I am somewhat embarrassed to admit, I, I'm not sure whether it's rational or not. And so one possibility is that this is just irrational. And so there's nothing else to be said, or it could be rational, but in a way that, it, that doesn't match up the group actions. But here there are cases that you know are, are rational, but that the prescribed cyclic group action is, is incompatible with the rational parameterization. Okay, um, I have almost no time left, so let me stop there and, and open the floor to see if there are any questions. Thank you. Great, so let's, uh, I guess before taking questions, let's again mute, unmute ourselves and, and thank Brendan. So, oh, I already did that, sorry. <laughs> great, uh, and now, great, so, uh, great, so questions now. Uh, well, how do you compute how do you show that this invariant is non-zero? Uh, you said it takes a lot of computer time, but what, what did the computer actually do? Um, so the computer, let me go back, I'm sorry. So it's a, it's, um, you're computing in this finitely generated abelian group. So I have this group generated by uh, symbols with relations. And um, I this gives a presentation of a finitely generated abelian group. And so I need to show that, um, that the symbol that I write down is non-zero in that group. So it is a, um, it's a linear algebra problem, a sparse linear algebra problem. And, um, so when people automate these computations, they, they use so, sort of sophisticated sparse linear algebra packages. I don't think that that was what was running on the Simons Foundation. I think it was just a straightforward computation in Sage. Um, but basically, if you have a place where you can compute whether an element is non-zero in a finitely presented abelian group, you can decide whether the beta invariant is non-zero. So you, you take all these invariants, uh, all these generators, you take all the relations, you write them all down, you compute. So um, yeah, it's not, it's, not, it's not deep mathematics, it's linear algebra. 
the Any deepest audience? mathematics. <laughs> I'm sorry? That's the deepest mathematics, Brendan. What are you talking about? That's the only, I think the only thing that people can actually compute is linear algebra. Maybe linear algebra over Z. But uh, so, you know. Um, Brendan, I have a question in the form of a suggested example. Yes. It seems to me that just throwing this out there, if I take, if I think about Hilbert modular surfaces, if I take, let's, let's take an example, if I take any real quadratic field that split at two, and I look at the Hilbert modular surface of full level two, I get a surface with an action of GL2F2. I could do this for two any prime, and I'm just choosing two because it's small, because that's S3. So then I get this very nice, extremely natural sequence of surfaces, each, each with its GL2F2 action. And surely those invariants mean something, right? I mean, if I, I mean, it just strikes me that it would be an interesting thing to compute and see where they, where those particular uh, S, S3 actions sit in your group of symbols as the, as the quadratic field grows. Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> I haven't Somebody done do that. that. I mean, I think that the people, I think that um, Noam and Abhinav Kumar they know they know which ones are of general type and which ones are not. So, but isn't your invariant seeing something kind of orthogonal to that? Yeah, I mean, of course you could evaluate it either way, huh. and yes, you could evaluate it and sort of blinkers yourself and just do the fixed point analysis, and that fixed point analysis would pick up most of the most of the the structure of the cusps. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, I guess that's what it would be about, yeah. So let me sh show you, the example I admitted is actually in that spirit. Um, so. These, I saw the PGL too and that made me think of it, yeah. Yeah, so, so these are actually uh, moduli spaces of abelian surfaces with a certain level 11 structure. Great. And so we're, we're actually computing um, the invariance in those cases, um, but it's still sort of work in progress. Um, but you're probably right that the surface cases are, should be easier from a technical standpoint. This is fairly hard. At least I found it hard to, to compute what the strata are. But yeah, this, this example comes from abelian, abelian, abelian surfaces. More questions? So I was uh, so I, I was trying to imagine how might one hope to use this to try to get at uh, uh, so there's some discussion as to your motivation uh, your initial motivation and so in hope of getting an irrational cubic uh, fourfold is uh, and trying to guess what you're trying to make if there is a, a a fourfold that is not rational but maybe it's geometrically rational and is the goal to describe something as geometrically rational and have some group action and then show that there's no way it can descend to something, uh, that the prior transition can descend to something rational. What's your long-term, what, what secretly is going on in your head with this? Um, what's secretly going on in my head is, is um, I am trying to understand how the machinery works, first of all. And I'm trying to communicate to people who are more on the algebra geometric side what the machinery can do. So to some extent, this is a marketing exercise that is, so, I mean, I, I, I don't think that this is gonna shed light on like which cubic fourfolds are rational. Um, but I think that it probably, I mean, the thing that, to what extent can this machinery be used to, to give a class, classification of like cyclic group actions on threefolds, um, rational threefolds up to conjugation. Um, that that's a kind of you know that's a kind of um, motivating problem. It's not a problem I think about too much, but I I think that people who who do that kind of geometric analysis, uh, they should be aware of these invariants because they they do actually provide a, a different way of distinguishing examples. Um, then just sort of the brute force classify the problem until it until it doesn't move anymore and then you're done. So it, it, it can give you a more economical way of, of differentiating cases. 
Yeah, so I, and I, I find the connections with um, with the modular forms and representation theory pretty pretty seductive, and I want to understand them more. So 